Hi everyone, welcome. This is the Honor Yoga and Honor Yoga Foundation Triple Cast podcast, um, where we have the awesome opportunity to chat with Honor Yoga teachers and owners and more. I'm Julie Melk. I'm the Director of Programming at Honor Yoga. And with me today on the podcast is the incomparable Joshua Ansley. He is an Honor Yoga Asana teacher. He's an Honor Yoga meditation teacher. And for Honor Yoga, he teaches the 200 hour teacher training. So welcome, Josh. Thank you so much. Great to be here. So 20 years ago, Josh, and please correct me if I'm wrong on any of this. You discovered yoga um, through theater, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yes. And since then, you've had extraordinary experiences that I've learned about some of them out of body experiences and you've sold all your belongings at one point or maybe even twice you've lived in Mexico you're a musician you've been in a rock band I don't know if you're currently still in a rock band you um, work with 12-step programs so I mean you have a huge uh, wealth of experiences, and I want I want to hear a little bit more about your intersection of all of that and yoga. So, if you could just maybe go through the timeline for us, we'd love to know. Uh, yeah. How long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> I know, so, right? Um, I'll keep it. I'll keep it tight. Um, <laughs> yeah. No. It's, you know, it's really interesting for me to just hear you even say some of these things. I guess I didn't realize. You know. You know, Julie and I were talking earlier too, just about understanding our own self worth, and it's like one of my biggest things. And just hearing, like, I was like, if I was listening to the introduction of like some of the stuff, I didn't, I didn't even give you all the stuff. Like, and I'm like, this, I was like, this is a pretty cool. This would be a pretty cool guy. It was, it was just, I was just getting like choked up a little bit listening to somebody else describe all the things that I've done. You know, so it was, that was pretty interesting. Um, <clears throat> and and really, that leads to. The whole core of everything is right. Is that at the core of everything is like is that we are these beautiful divine beings is really what is honestly what I believe. You know, and part of that is experiential, and part of it is from the teachings. Uh, part of it might just be hope, you know. But that's I don't I don't care if if you if my belief is that there's something better, so I'm moving in that direction. You know, if I believe that there's a way out or something, so. Um, but I also it's part of the problem because I feel like I spent 20 years, you know, uh, or more even of my life trying to create the most interesting man possible. And it was all from the not from the greatest places, you know. Um, but that it, that's where it started about 20, almost exactly 20 years ago. Uh, I was at Mason Grove School of the Arts at Rutgers University studying theater. Um, I had gotten I, I was a model and an actor uh growing up when i was a kid did, did some things and in, in, uh, i was like a ford model and did some acting in the city and whatnot and um so it was it was it was always a part of my life just the the artistry and the creativity aspect of it and um which was actually a, a big thing even with confronting myself of recognizing where that is even come from in my life but it, within the program of Mason Grove School of the Arts, we did a lot of work that was now what I know to be a lot of really deep healing work. It's kind of all the stuff that we do. And uh, that really resulted in me having a huge, a uh, tremendous spiritual awakening. I mean, the, the concept behind the Meisner method that we were studying was the idea is to get to your most authentic self. I mean, so for if for the spiritual aspects, that's what we're actually trying to do, right? So in an artistic effort, that's what we were trying to do is create authenticity on stage and all the practices that we did to do that were actually these ancient practices now that I understand of like studying yoga and philosophy and and um, spirituality I'm like of course I had this spiritual awakening you know this really profound thing and I did I had some like out-of-body experiences I had no idea what was going on it was like pretty it was pretty profound I thought I was the second coming of Christ for a little bit but turns out that that was not the case um and but really it was that this journey that I started to take was was an understanding of something deeper than what we usually perceive reality to be. And that was really um, the, the issue was at that point that I did not have it was 
I wanted to, I, I mean, I was going to join a monastery. I was thinking about, you know, really joining a monastery because I was like, how could I not pursue this? Um, and I wish somebody would have given me the Bhagavad Gita at that point, which is an ancient text of, of yoga that really is about living life on the battlefield, you know, the spiritual life on the battlefield of life, really, and being out there and not retreating to some place, but actually being in the world, but not of it, you know. Um, but at the time, I was thinking about joining a monastery and whatnot, and I, I did not. And I really believed that my purpose was to be of service through my artistry. And I had no way to continue or maintain it because I really didn't have a program. I mean, I did that at school and I went through that, but then I didn't have a, a network or a program to really work to keep this active in my life. And so uh, I went to sex, drugs, and rock and roll for a long time. And that was, <clears throat> you know, I got signed as a musician and toured, uh, toured for years as a musician and, you know, did acting and music a long time for a long time. And, um, yeah, at, at, at going through that experience, um, I didn't, like I said, I didn't really, I, I, that's in those times is actually where I wound up earlier on is where I wound up getting, getting into actual yoga, but I would only use yoga when things were got really bad in my life was how it actually worked. It was like things would get really bad. I'd be so confused or not. And I'd bring yoga back into my life. So it was very intermittent and on and off. And it sounds so simple, but once I realized that I could actually have, what would what would my life be like if I actually did yoga and per pursued this sort of stuff when things were good, you know, that's when I brought it into my life on a more regular basis, and um, so it was it was intermittently through my life with like music and all that kind of stuff, and then about ten years ago, so it was about ten years after I had started intermittently, about ten years ago. I had another sort of awakening. Um, I broke up with a girl, quit my job, um, did some yoga teacher training, you know, went vegan, quit drinking, sold all my stuff and moved to Mexico like you do, you know. And uh, it was <clears throat> it was it was different than the first time. It was it was though it was I'm glad I had the first sort of awakening to really know what was happening, to have some sort of reference point to go to, because it was, um, at least then I had, when I got into things at that point, you know, I, I had, I had gotten into, I have been now sober for six and a half years, uh, cause at that point I stopped, but I didn't have again, a program of anything. I w there was nothing that I was doing. It was just, you know, kind of overtaking me instead of me taking <clears throat> an active, uh, part in, in the process. So when I moved to Mexico, things went really bad down there too. Uh, it was usually through relationship, and that's where uh, most of my troubles came from understanding how I relate to the rest of the world. And uh, I wound up moving back from Mexico like six and a half years ago, and had to uh, get sober in a lot of different, a lot of different twelve-step programs and therapy, and it became much more real than some sort of. Uh, you know, mystical, beautiful experience it became like a real practical understanding of how I'm operating in this world and need to reassess and and evolve and 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 transform into something different, which is now a daily daily process in my life. So, I don't know if that was what you were looking for. Absolutely. I mean, more. Thank you so much for all that. There's so many golden nuggets in there that I want to pull apart. <clears throat> One of them that you, you, you answered, so I don't have to ask that question, but you mentioned um, being part of the world, in the world, not of it. That's what you said. Will you explain mm -hmm. that? Will you explain that more? Like, what, what does that feel like? Uh, freedom. It's what in the philosophy we would probably call moksha. Not that I have liberation or enlightenment or anything like that. I mean, there's lots of different perspectives of how we can go perceive these things. I mean, that's part of the issue is why it makes it so confusing is because people perceive it from different places along the spectrum and think that they are either right or that their way is the way of understanding. And I, I just, I have no idea, <laughs> you know, I was going to say it doesn't feel like anything cause it's not a, it's not necessarily a feeling <laughs> like, 
you know, once I really started to break down and understand both through Eastern and Western understandings, you know, I've done a lot of, you know, I work in trauma, I work with people that are traumatized. I've worked through a lot of my own trauma and understanding, um, what it, what it is, it, the, the difference between an emotion and a feeling, a thought, a physical sensation, how they are all connected is, it might sound pretty basic, but it's some profoundly transformational understanding. Um, and the, the most, <clears throat> the deepest teaching was that it's, I, I kind of have a mix of, you know, I went to, I was raised Roman Catholic and I went to Catholic school and have a lot of Christian background, but it's not, uh, I was not practicing and it was not something that was, you know, important to me necessarily, but it was the only reference point that I've had when I had spiritual awakening in the beginning, uh, the first time 20 years ago. And at that point I started reading about, um, yoga from, um, Paramahansa Yogananda and the autobiography of Yogi. And actually one of his followers had a book called Christ Consciousness. And I started to really get into the, the similarities between, between Christ and Krishna and these, these perspectives and it, not really recognizing it as the human being. But they talk about this. I could go off on a lot on this, but like you, you opened up that, that door. But um, the, the idea that when an ascended master is talking and he says, I, he's not talking, he or she is not talking about the mind-body complex that that personality is apparent to the us in this world's duality, right? What they're ref what they're referring to is the I is the ultimate consciousness, is that which is beyond all of it, that which is, it, dare I say, doesn't even exist actually because it's beyond the ex ex existing reality. Um, and so, it's sort of like becoming the sakshi, the witness. We talk about sometimes there's this concept of being the witness. And so when you become a witness to your thoughts, whatever it is you can really witness, you can witness your body. You're not necessarily that thing. And the teaching then is that you are the awareness by which all of those things are known. So when an ascended master is talking about that I and says, surrender unto me, I mean, Christ and Krishna said, they taught this, they literally verbatim say the same things, but like hundreds of years apart in different languages and... I mean, it's pretty amazing stuff. Um, I love, actually, look at that. There's a Christ and Krishna book right here. It's, like, <laughs> it's just always really fascinated me because the singularity, the oneness that they're talking about, it, usually it becomes like it's our oneness versus your oneness. No, that's not oneness, and that's duality. That's not right. singularity. Um, so <clears throat> that, finding that oneness within yourself is really what's, what it is really becomes about, that singularity that is something beyond the mind, something beyond the body, something beyond the emotions. I mean, and that's a, a really broad thing. Again, I could talk about this for hours, but getting to the point of really becoming in this world and not of it is that we're not retreating from the world like I spoke about the Bhagavad Gita is how to, take, how to connect to that space that is beyond all of it and then engage with the world more fully, you know? Before enlightenment, I chopped wood and carried water. After enlightenment, I chopped wood and carried water. You know, that our action might not even be different, but it's the manner in which, and the attitude with which we take that action that is entirely different from a completely different perspective. And most people, I, I don't like to speak about most people, but I, but I could feel that a lot of humanity though is, engaging, you know, through the mind and the body and always out into the external world and neglecting and negating the divine core of who we truly are. And that doesn't become this love everybody kind of thing. It, it's something beyond that even. It's a space that really can't be described. But if we can just touch that for a moment, I'm going to get emotional. <laughs> if we could touch that for a moment and bring that into the world through our actions, the whole world would be different. You know, if it's, if it's going inward to find that place of happiness as opposed to the outward world, it's not a denial that there's messed up stuff in the world and the world is a mess. It's actually how we can be more effectively engaged with that to change it from this place of connection within ourselves, you know. So I don't know if that makes sense. It does. It actually wraps it all together from where you started. I And there's two things there that, that this is like the perfect segue. First thing um, that I that I want to talk about is coping mechanisms and yoga. And yeah, you mentioned sex, drugs, rock and roll. And then I'm like, 
going to put yoga on there. <laughs> um, and then I want to bring it back to interoception, what you're talking, that, which, which I'm interpreting as this practice of moving inward um, and that we're not taught that in and of itself. It, there's a million reasons to avoid it and go to coping mechanisms. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but let's start with just coping mechanisms and yoga. When I say that, what, what, what brings to your mind? Like, I, I used to be much more, it's funny, I started a lot with this Vedantic philosophy, which is at our divine core, and it's something beyond our mind and our thoughts and all this kind of stuff, and it's this really great principle that can be life transforming. But oftentimes, then what that doesn't do is necessarily hold space for all the things that are happening in our minds and in our bodies, and it's not compassionate. And there can be a lot of uh, gurus and leaders and things like that that um, can be insensitive to what is happening in the mind and the body and these these places, these the mind-body complex of, of their followers or individuals or whomever, yoga teachers, I don't need to be just so what the guru aspect of it, but... Um, so it, because the, the issue is for me, it's all in my mind that doesn't now that it's even like that right now. It's like, it's not, it's not all in your mind. It doesn't mean the injustice is not happening. That's what I said in the world. Right. But the suffering is not caused by the world, but how I relate to it. And I even struggle with being, you know, a white man saying things like that because I don't understand the different struggles of other people. So I can't go to a black woman and tell her that, that you know, the suffering is in, not in her, it is not in the world, but how she relates to it. But in, in some sort of understanding of how we can, that doesn't mean you change the way you relate to it. So you just have to accept this awful atrocity. Maybe the way you relate to it is you get yourself away from it. Or, you know, I don't know what the, how that manifests in this, in this reality, in, in the dualistic sense in the external world. Right. Um, and there's a lot of different theories on that working outside in and inside out. Right. And I really kind of believe in both. I think that the fact, the information that we are, are, that at our core we are this divine beautiful thing is sort of the alpha and the omega it's the beginning and the end the first and the last it's a piece of information that can bring me on my journey towards that while i sift through all the stuff then having that as a center point of of strength and stability to then ultimately get to that point at the end hopefully if i or you know maybe that's just a carrot that brings us eternally on towards a better space and there is no end goal i don't actually know um so I think that it's important to, you know, for me, when it comes into something like restorative yoga, like this was, I used to have this mindset from this Vedantic perspective of yoga is not an escape. Yoga is not an escape. You know, it's, it's getting into things. And I'm, but then now I'm like, hey, if you need to escape and you're using yoga instead of <laughs> drugs, alcohol, food, people, cigarettes, work, gambling, whatever, whatever it might be, then I think that's a wonderful thing. Because then at some point on your process, you're going to recognize, hey, wait a minute, this is where I can leap off from here now, you know, and, and take a new step into something deeper. I mean, that they say that the hardest thing about the enlightenment, which I have no idea because I'm not there, but is to actually let go of the spiritual process. Is because it's the desire for things that actually is uh, from a Buddhist perspective is that the desire is what's causing the issues is the agitation. And that comes from a vidya, which is ignorance, the ignorance of the divine core of who we are. So we go into the external world to find it, be it in drugs and alcohol because we're avoiding something or be it in how much hummus I eat now. I don't really have many, <laughs> I don't really have many vices now other than like than hummus. And now even you know, Megan, my girlfriend, who's another phenomenal, incomparable teacher at Honor Yoga, she was joking about, I mean, it's kind of an expensive hummus habit. <laughs> and uh, I don't mean to joke about it, but it's my how, my how things have changed. But I don't, I don't dip into my hummus. I scoop into my hummus. Yeah. And that's like a, a, a vast difference in caloric intake as well as financial output for the amount of hummus that, <laughs> that I eat. And I tried dipping, and it's like it, 
it's triggering for me. It's very difficult for me to not just scoop. I'm like, I'm not getting enough. And it's like, really, even with, I'm now down to hummus and I have to limit my intake of hummus on that. But it's my mind and my p habits and my patterns are constantly looking for something. But if I'm on hummus as opposed to, you know, alcohol, then that's a process for me and that's good. So I don't know if this is all making sense to kind of like you said, bringing it back where it's like, I do believe that if, if yoga is your coping mechanism, I think that's fantastic because then inherently within the teachings of yoga, be it next week or 40 years from now, you know, I say to my students all the time, I realize that it's like maybe one day you'll be like, oh, that's what he was talking about. You know, yeah. I've, I've, I've seen my students do that on a physical level. I've had a student, I remember for like six months in my class and she was like, she literally was like, oh, that's what you mean. It was some cue about pulling the abdominals in or something like that. And she was like, that's what you're talking about. She finally experienced what I was talking about when we were in the class. It was pretty interesting to see. But yeah. I think that's even for myself. I'm like, maybe, <clears throat> maybe one day I'll be like, oh, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's great. When the student is ready, that's what my teacher used to say all the time. And, and that's that, you know, that's what it brings to mind for me, the repetition of particularly, like you use the example of saying one, one instruction, and you've said it over and over. And then it's when their inner environment really is ready to receive that it's received. So Let's talk about the inner environment. I've taken your um, yoga nidra meditation classes and they are a profound experience for me. Um, I, I cry in them, <laughs> which I think is a good thing. And um, yoga nidra in and of itself for me has been really the one of like the number one way for me to become imaginative about my inner world and bring that imagination of my inner world to like a real, real experience of my inner world. Um, tell me about your history of yoga nidra. Like what, what was your first experience with that? Um, how, how did you start teaching it? What effect has impact has it had on you? Um, I, it's had an incredible impact. I, I feel like thinking about it when I realized it was actually my first experience with it was uh, doing voice and speech work in school, you know, 20 years ago. And there was a voice instructor that I had. I mean, a lot of it about, is about connecting and, um, to, I mean, to, to, our, to our breath and really having the support of our breath. I mean, it's phenomenal how many similarities there are between the acting and, and understanding yourself and the emotions and why we do anything like that we do. Part of the work was uh, you, have a, you have an action on each line, so you have to understand why you're saying each line. If you don't have something that you're trying to get from the other person, the scene kind of falls flat. This is just an example I thought it was really interesting, a little tangent for a second, but... Um, so it was like you had to really understand what you wanted on each line. So you really had to understand what, as you as a character, you had to really think about the psychology of what it is that you're trying to do. What's your motive for every single line that you take in this in this play or movie or whatever? And that's like, how could that not affect your understanding your motives of why you do everything in the world? Oh, right? yeah. And then it's like getting the, on the breath and your support to how to really be in the space of the support for the voice and to have it be strong without being constricted up here. So in voice and speech work was the first time that I, my teacher had ever done something like this sort of extended, you know, it wasn't necessarily a Nogi Nidra, it was, it was never really put into those spiritual terms. Like we had a, a movement class, which was all kinds of like spinning up, he would call it, and he called them circles of energy. He's like, and working with the different <laughs> circles of energy, and I was like, wow, ah, okay, what's he talking about? I don't know. And now I'm like, oh. Right, he's talking about the chakras. Like twenty years later, he was trying to make his own system of you know movement and not call them chakras. And, but so it was all this stuff that we were working with. So that was the first experience that I had with it. And I remember exactly like you're saying. So many of us, I even feel it as I'm talking so much. I'm so like I get so hyped up and I'm out here, and my energy becomes outward driven. 
And just the, you know, the moment of actually sitting down and breathing and slowing that down, what starts to happen when we go inward. I remember that profound experience in, uh, in, in back in college. And what that is as, as an artist, and whether, whether and I think we're all artists, or all have potential to be artists, because we're all creating all the time. And I'm not just being flippant and cheesy about that. Like, we really are creating the lives that we choose to create, you know, with other factors as well. Again, it's not, it's not black and white. It's not dualistic in that sense. Or I, I usually like to say the singularity includes the duality. Otherwise, it wouldn't be singularity. It would be duality. <laughs> singularity includes everything. <laughs> So that was the first experience I had with it was in was in college and uh, I don't I just remember it being um, like you're saying I, I don't remember anything exactly but the inner but the inner life you know whatever that means right we we use these terms and we're like because there's no whether it be teachers or whoever it is we don't really have the ways to explain exactly what these things are or these experiences are that are not you know just our common mundane everyday experiences uh, which even sometimes we miss out on that and it makes it makes this life more enriching when we are connected to our senses and connected to our bodies you know you're talking about interoception and you know proprioception and things like that and what yoga does as a whole you know can to make us so connected to actually living our, our, our best life in this moment um, but that being said uh, I didn't really have much interaction with it then for several, uh, were over a decade. And it was actually really when I got back into, uh, I needed, you know, it was kind of like I was shown this truth of life and I didn't know how to maintain it. And I went away from it for so long. And it was almost like, um, I don't, it's not, it's not that it's a punishment, but it's a, it was like a reminder to be like, Hey, you're straying, you're straying, you're straying, come, you know, come back. And so when I came back, it was like, I needed to come back. You know, it wasn't just like, a, Oh, and usually a lot of times this work isn't done until we need to, you know, and Atta Yoga Nishasana, like now yoga, like you've tried everything out. There's different perspectives on this too, but <laughs> you've tried everything else. It's not working or you've, you've exhausted your play with the external world are you ready now to finally come into this internal journey and find this? And I needed to do that. Uh, so for me, it was actually about finding safety within because I was so, I was so broken, honestly, that I didn't know. I was terrified of my own shadow. Uh, you know, at the end, I was like um, the trauma that was coming out because it was ready to come out um, was I did not feel safe anywhere, nowhere. Not, and certainly not within myself. So it really came into finding a practice that um, really, in, actually in restorative yoga, it was really where it came back in, you know, and taking restorative yoga classes and, and having to find that space of peace within and find that stability. And I had to believe the Vedantic teachings. I had to believe that... Um, it started to make sense to me that everything in this external world is constantly moving and changing. It's in constant flux. So if some of it is more steady than others, you know, a mountain might be more steady than a river in terms of like actual stability. But uh, if you are seeking it, your stability in the external world in some way, anything is going to invariably change, you know, and, and not to be extreme about it, but even within our relationships, even with our loved ones, even the longest, I mean, life itself is, you know, is temporal, you know, and the impermanence of things. And so really grasping and accepting that was like, all right, then where do I find this stability? And am I supposed to just be okay with, or it, it, where, how do I be okay with the destruction of all that is, you know, that is in this cycle of life? And so that had to be coming from within. So that was kind of like forced me to move into find the stability and safety within myself. And so really in restorative yoga was where uh, that practice started to come back out again. And uh, then I was... I, I just was jumping in because as I got into places like uh, a lot of my trauma was worked through in a, a thing called adult children, alcoholics and other dysfunctional families. And it's a 12 step program that is very different. Uh, it's a trauma informed understanding of being raised in, in dysfunction and um, being powerless over 
that was something I understood powerlessness about. Like I was powerless over how this mind body mechanism was developed, you know, and actually with yoga nidra, when we cycle through the different, this is a little tangential, but bringing it to the yoga nidra of, of cycling through the different levels of consciousness through the different brain wavelengths of like, uh, you know, usually in beta and then alpha, theta and delta. And these are our developmental stages of where our mind actually is the most at when we're younger and when we're when we're able to that's why children are able to you know learn languages a lot more quickly and stuff like that because they're able to bring in so much more information you were talking earlier we were talking earlier about the um, elasticity right the neuroplasticity okay. and, and uh so th those things were at those times i was programmed i'm not so well <laughs> You know, and I, and, I st <laughs> and that was that is very humbling of recognizing. Like, uh, I think I know myself, and I'm like, wow, there's actually this deeper programming that is beyond who I think I am that has conditioned me to operate in the world in not the most productive way. And you know, so the the healing, really, the healing is is uh, what happened most. And when I got into inner child work and studying and and going into inner, inner child meditation when I would do a, a really deep body relaxation of a yoga nidra type and then do and cycle into these deeper places of the subconscious and recognize there were parts of my psyche sort of in a, a shamanic journey that's kind of what they when when they have um, a soul retrieval the idea is that when you have a traumatic experience there's some sort of uh, your your psyche so a part of it believes that it has passed right that this mm -hmm. is the, the, the idea so you go back and retrieve but really what you're doing is sort of is inner child work is going back and retrieving that part of your psyche and healing that that space and the the wholeness that can come from that is i can't even i cannot like that has been the most honestly the most transformational aspect of my life has been you know inner child meditation and going back and and taking care of that child and recognizing that how the power of that of really re restoring my psyche back to, to wholeness and completeness um, and it happened much more effectively that as opposed to sitting there for a three-minute meditation but going into a deep you know hypnosis sort of you know state of going into these deeper brain wavelengths and places and, and then actually you know engaging with that part of my psyche and healing in that level is really where it started to the real change happened in my life and you, it, you said that um, you first would do a deep body relaxation, like a yoga nidra, before the, the uh, inner child meditation. Yeah, I mean that's what that, that's the way I prefer to do it. Right. Um, I think there's something to, you know, as we talk about all these details of it, moving from fight, flight, or freeze into rest and digest or what, however you want to call it, this sympathetic nervous system into the parasympathetic nervous system. And, you know, m m my mechanism when it's engaging with the external world is constantly scanning for threats. It's hypervigilant, you know, and it, I used to think this was all like some crazy mystical stuff that our emotions were held in our bodies somewhere. I'm like, Oh my God, no, it makes complete, it's, it's science. If you get scared, you know, different chemicals, the thought of, of there being a danger, whether there is a danger or not, and that's a different, that's a different story. There is right. a danger. That's why we have these things in the first place. Yeah. But my mechanism is off balance to not actually perceive when there's a danger or not. So it's constantly perceiving danger hypervigilantly and from not necessarily from a bear or from even now a rageaholic parent or something like that, but from, you know, anybody that, my email you know, from from julie's email <laughs> you know that i'm like something's wrong it's like no nothing's wrong she's actually trying to see if you want to do an interview for something and like right. then i'm like then should, could i do i even have something to offer you know like there's all this conditioning yeah. that that comes in so the the body scan was so important to me because it i need to go to work the body into recognizing that it's that it is safe that the, on, on on these deeper levels you know, I can sit here and relax, but there's there's muscles all in here. The fascia is all tightened up in ways that is still holding on because it's still it's just so used to holding on. So as I can breathe and slow everything down and literally change, you know, the, the makeup of everything that's happening in there and 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 get it to be in the you know get myself to recognize that it's okay. 
or uh, get myself, get my body and my mind. You know, myself is always okay. <laughs> my body yeah. and my mind just don't know that. So. Yeah. So, and for those, um, yeah. So use the body to control the mind. That's one of my favorite practices. That's one of my favorite sayings. That's one of my favorite scientific theories is, you know, don't, don't try to use the mind to control the mind, but use the body to control the mind. And I think that's where practices like yoga nidra has really made its um, influence on me and, and my triggers, my traumas, right. Um, those, those experiences that you're talking about, they served us when we were small beings and did have to fight or freeze or flight. Mm -hmm. But as adults and that our flow of engagement and healthy relationship or creativity, or, you know, um, really, expend all of our energy on, you know, worry and things like that. But talking just, I want to talk just another minute or two about yoga nidra because you have a workshop coming up, which we invite everyone to join where they can experience this practice with you, learn a little bit more about it, but what, um, just define yoga nidra really briefly for everyone. And also what is like the felt experience, like for just even for you, the, the felt physical experience. Yeah. I can't really say what the felt experience will be for anybody, you know, like I, I know that yeah. you understand that, but like, um, because I think we all experience life through very different lenses and, and different ways in some ways, very similar. Uh, the Nidra itself is uh, a very relatively recent developing practice, um, it, you know, based on a lot of ancient teachings, but it's not an, actually an ancient practice. It's, it's around from like the 1970s from Swami Sityan, Satyananda. Um, and because, you know, that's what's so interesting about it. you read from so many different places. I have so many different teachers, amazing teachers that say the complete opposite things, and it can be very confusing. Um, one of my greatest teachers was like, it's not about relaxation. And it's like, no, the, the ancient teachings are, it moves from the sub to subtle to the gross. So when you, so it's, it's kind of the opposite of what you're saying about, you know, use the body to, but I'm, and I used to be in that mindset, if you will, or, you know, that something beyond the mind, then the higher power is where we go to, to control the mind. And I'm like, okay, but working a way back in, yeah, I like to work, like I said, inside out and the outside in. Mm -hmm. Um, so yoga nidra is a relatively newer practice where you, 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 there's several stages to it. There's like a, you set an intention and, um, you know, and I, and I do take some liberties with it. You know, it is, it's kind of an open interpretation of things, but it usually involves like a, a, a body scan and it revolves, it kind of involves a rotation of consciousness as I was saying of getting very, very relaxed and moving into different stages of consciousness through the mind. So you kind of come in and out of consciousness. It's not like you're, you know, the, the, the workshop's going to be an hour and a half. It'll probably be near an hour of the actual practice itself. And then other will be discussion and then, you know, open time to share or something. Um, but it's, uh, this, this cycling through the consciousness is sort of like there's this idea in the philosophy called the koshas and it's the different bodies that we have and the different layers of who we are and it's literally kind of moving in through the different layers of who we are all the way down into the bliss and beyond you know and so we contact this space which you know also within Vedantic philosophy they talk about um, the levels of being in deep sleep in dream sleep and awake uh, and it's very much the le levels of delta brain wavelength. And so really what we're doing is cycling down into these places where we're getting into the subconscious and it's very healing. It's where the body and the, the brain really heals itself in deep sleep and things like that, you know. Um, so as far as the actual experience of it, uh, and, you know, I add things and I add the live music, you know, I sing before and afterwards, you know, the singing and playing guitar. And um, so that's like my own personal touch that I add to it and you know, part of it is setting an intention there's like different different steps to it um, and then I just lost what the second part or the personal the, the experience of it um, mm -hmm. for me for me I don't know what that was like 
Christopher Walken. For me, it's a thing. Uh, just finally, you know, it's not something that you come in and people, a lot of people, when it comes to meditation, be like, I can't meditate. My, my mind is a mess. And I'm like, okay. And there's, there's a lot of different layers of that too. I don't necessarily think that you should necessarily start with the meditations that I do are guided meditation. So it actually gives your mind something to focus on as opposed to like coming to silence and just sitting in silence in some way. That's really not what it's about, you know? Um, so this is this sort of meditation, because it is an, an element, there's it is a meditation, is a healing process to work into the stuff that could actually be blocking your mind from being able to focus in certain ways. So the experience for me is not that we come in and be like, oh, immediately calm down and relax. Sometimes it might take 20 minutes of the practice for my mind to actually settle down. And then it kind of gets into this, for me, it gets into this place of kind of coming in and out of, in, in and out of consciousness so it's not like you have to follow everything and be totally yeah. attentive and awake through the whole thing but there's this idea that the body goes into complete relaxation and, and when, when you consciously go through the body like we think yeah i'm kind of relaxed but when you actually relax like your left finger your left pinky and then your ring finger and you actually bring your awareness again back into this interoception and proprioceptive ideas um you, you, sometimes I'm very shocked or I wasn't aware that I was holding in my scalp that I was like a lot of times I hold my ears up a little bit and when I, when I when you get into the area about the scalp and it's like oh I can I can actually realize that I'm that I'm holding in these places and when that starts to release on deeper and deeper levels you just get into a relaxation that we wouldn't do from just going to sleep we can allow the body to because your body will go to sleep and if you if you might have trouble sleeping or if you actually do get to sleep you might be still tense in your sleep so this is an actual conscious chance to really soften and relax into different areas of the body and allow the body to heal and the mind to heal in ways and work together in ways that almost seem mystical but are very quite logical and scientific you know it's only Sadhguru talks about it's only mystical because we don't we don't understand it or don't know it and that's really well that mystical really is or mysticism really is but so So come on out and join. <laughs> I, I think the, the relaxation aspect of my meditation, I do that actually in every meditation that I teach. You know, I teach like Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday mornings in the meditations for honor yoga. And I start with that, a quick body scan just to be like aware mm -hmm. of the body. Like it's such a powerful part of the practice for me to be, to actually recognizing where I'm holding stuff because you know, I just want to get throw this in there. I mean, it's powerful to recognize. You know, if if I scare you, and you you have a physical reaction to it, your muscles, certain muscles are holding, they're protecting, they're covering the heart, whatever it is, the vital organs. You know, and there's the instincts of like covering and protecting. And if you've had some experiences, or if you were in a situation where there was constant exposure to something that was a danger or a threat, you start to live that way entirely. Right. And like or if there was one specific event that happened, you know, it, 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 the, you know, the body, there's a great book. Oh, this one. The body keeps the score. Yeah. Right? And it and has all, you know, so we store all this stuff in the body. And when you start to soften and relax in these places that you don't even know you're holding because you're walking around that way all the time. There's a lot of stuff can actually start to clear out. And it, most people, a lot, well, not most people, some people don't subconsciously want to want to, to relax because it might like, bring up all the stuff that but it just yeah. needs to be cleared out just so much of it just needs to be processed and, and leave and the mind can be mine let's I, I speak from my own experience my mind was like this and it was like I didn't, I didn't want to just settle down because I didn't want to look at it but once I just did it was like you know, and then, then the mind, and now it's like my meditation process has gotten so much deeper and gets deeper by the day because the healing that happens underneath it is allows the mind to, to focus because right now, or in the beginning, it was not. So it's like my mind is like this, and if I think I am the mind, that means I'm like this. Once I recognize I am not the mind and I'm like this, the mind eventually starts to come down to this bit. This has been amazing. This has been so awesome and um, real. And thank you for sharing so much with us. And you're just uh, always Joshua, 
you know, you come through with your truest self all the time. I don't know if you recognize that, but I have always seen that about you, noticed that, and been um, magnetized to that because it does create a trust and a safe place. And um, yeah, I love being in conversation with you. So thanks for giving me about 45 minutes and everyone else too. Um, who's listening and will be listening. Do you know who Jennifer or Jen Pestiloff is? She wrote a book called On Being Human. Mm, I don't think so. Um, well, she, every year around the new year time, she'll do a, a post on social media saying, give yourself a B medal. And um, what she She's asking her followers in her community to do is, um, as I did for you in the beginning, talk about who you are and what your achievements and your struggles have been. And it's a really cool post to always read because people start to tell why they're giving themselves a medal. And it could be the past year, it could be the past 10 years, but I'm ending with that because Joshua, I want you to give yourself a medal I want you to write down <laughs> everything you've done in the past 20 years. You're a phenomenal human being and I'm so happy to be your friend and know you. Wow, Julie, that's beautiful. Thank you. I, I Sincerely, that's really beautiful. And that's also pretty wild because the other day I had this thought. I was like, I have to write down all of this cool stuff. I mean, I'm working on a new, you were saying, I don't know if you're still in the band, I'm working on a new record and, and Megan's singing on it. And it's like, I've written this whole record and been recording it for several years and making it happen. And I've, I'm a filmmaker and I'm working, directing a video, I'm doing all this stuff. And it's like, I, I, I think I was like, I want to write it down and look at it on the wall and be like, to remind myself, not out of arrogance and ego, but to be like, I have to remind myself of how worthy I am in yeah. a moment because I, I, I forget and I don't know it and all this old conditioning comes up. So that, that's amazing that you say that. So now I, I know that I have to do it because that was literally in my thought process. Good, yes, the signs are there. I want you to do that. I do it, I've done it on the daily before just to get through certain days and periods of my life Brilliant. where I was, I took a walk today, you know, I fed my dog today, I played with my dog, but like all these things we don't give ourselves credit for, even if in a 10 hour period, but you, my friend, yes, you deserve a medal and um, yeah, you deserve your own recognition of your own work. Thank you so much, Julie. You're so welcome. I'm so happy to have had this time with you. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks for yes, thank listening you. in. Yeah, if you have any more questions, um, feel free to email me, Julie at Honor Yoga. I almost forgot to announce, August 25th is a Wednesday in the evening, 7 p.m. Eastern time. So if you're on a different time zone, just note that 7 p.m. Eastern time to 8.30 will be Josh's Yoga Nidra workshop. You can attend via live stream and sign up at any Honor Yoga website for it. So go to your home studio website, sign up um, in the workshop section of, of the page or mind body. Did I forget anything, Josh? I don't think so. You okay. Okay, cool. All right. Have a great day. Thank you. <laughs>